All right, hey. Are we all here? How you guys doing today? All right, welcome Anthony, Antonio, hello again. Dimralt, hello Miguel Perez. Hey, Lar. Everybody welcome Lar, an amazing artist and cartoonist from Canada and a dear sweet man. Yeah, I'm a uh, I'm going to do the overlay thing on top of uh, Photoshop today, so I got a green screen up and figure I needed some kind of background for the intro, so. All right, oh, lots of people joining in here. Hi, Jim. <laughs> yeah, actually I actually made this background after, from a couple different um, uh, stock footage things and put them together in Photoshop and uh, Premiere and uh, just having a little fun, I guess. All right. Hello from Ooh, Uzbekistan. All right. All right. So, if you guys uh, aren't familiar with the uh, the concept of the Riley abstraction, what what how I learned it was <clears throat> in art school, we'd use the abstraction for the initial lay-in of the portrait or of the figure. There's an abstraction for the head and an abstraction for the figure. And they were invented by a uh, teacher, an uh, illustrator and teacher in the early 20th century named Frank Riley. Uh, he was a really methodical dude. He had a system for everything. He had a really detailed palette system that took like a couple hours to set up for his oil colors where everything was in grades of values along a spectrum of colors. Uh, Anyway, it's, it's a way, though, of teaching people how to draw the head and figure in different uh, perspectives and different uh, angles that helps the construction still look sound and correct no matter what angle you're working through. And it's similar to a lot of the other head diagrams you might find in art books, like uh, the Loomis diagram for the standard adult head. Other diagrams, though, take uh, sort of a, a generic approach to the head where they uh, tell you Okay, so there's a certain amount of distance between each feature. The eyes are one eye width apart. Uh, the, the, the face can be divided into thirds from the brow, uh, nose, and chin, and so on. And those are things you can memorize that do definitely help the, uh, the process of drawing when you're just starting out. But the way the Riley method is a little different is that it doesn't actually have specific uh, measurements. You base it on what you're looking at, so it's helping you see and observe and measure distances while you're drawing. But it's using the same sort of template or grid uh, for the face. And Riley's uh, grid, his abstraction was fairly complex with a lot of uh, lines or rhythm lines, is what we call them. And at the art school that I went to, we actually uh, uh, pared it down, we simplified it a bit, and I simplified it a bit more for my own purposes when I designed my caricature course because there's certain rhythms that I don't you know, use or find that useful or valuable when I'm drawing. Uh, so here is a quick uh, look at what... Okay, hey, I'm back. Sorry about that. When I was... Um, can you hear me now? Just making sure you can hear me now. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I set the, uh, the live stream up a little hastily, I guess, and I didn't add a sound option for when I switched over to the Adobe PDF. <laughs> uh, okay, so anyway, what I was just saying there, sorry about the mess up, uh, was the Riley rhythms are based on not only the proportions and the plane changes that are in the face, but it highlights or marks out the connections between the features or the relationships between the features of the face. And by features, I don't just mean the eyes, nose, and mouth, but I mean significant landmarks, like the cheekbones and the division between the temple and the forehead and uh, the way the eyes connect to each other, the corners of the eyes, the inside and the outside corners of the eyes. It's, it's drawing landmarks. And the reason we call them rhythms, I think, uh, I heard this explanation once, and I think it uh, actually is pretty sound, is, uh, let me switch over to here. Uh, so we call them rhythm lines, sort of like the, because of the reason is we are connecting different beats, different landmarks. So if I had like say, like say, let's just say I was marking out musical notation and I was uh, going to, like say they, there's a drum beat there, there's a drum beat there, drum beat there and there. So these 
are marking out the significant landmarks of, say, the music the, or the drum beat. If I want to find the path or draw that, what that rhythm looks like, I would draw a continuous straight line. So I've drawn the line of the rhythm. Uh, in a drawing, of course, there's going to be landmarks in different places, not just in a straight line. So if I wanted to, say, reproduce these rhythms, these, these four drum beats here, I would draw a rhythm line that looked sort of curved like that and connected them all together. And that, that's the basic concept. That's why we call it rhythm lines. It's, uh, otherwise, it might be a bit confusing. Uh, so hopefully that, uh, hopefully that makes sense. Uh, let's see. So that's the basic rundown of the, what the abstraction is. Now, how we use it is we would be trained in the beginning stages of uh, the art school to uh, construct the head using the, these rhythm lines. The PDF that you saw, the, the diagram of the head. Sorry, I can't show it right now or I'll lose the sound. <laughs> Um, we would construct the head with those rhythm lines and then just build the features on top of that. Like we draw the rhythms very lightly and then erase them as we go as we draw the features on top of everything. And it, uh, the thinking behind drawing with the rhythms as opposed to just drawing the contours immediately is it's a lot easier and simpler and uh, more manageable to draw complex shapes if you reduce them to simple shapes first. So we got a uh, like a cylinder here of the like it represents a human head. And then the division lines between the brow, nose, and chin. Well, that's not really, that's exaggerated. I guess it's like a caricature cylinder of a human face. So it's a lot easier to draw and reproduce that and make sure that these lines are correct in perspective. You can see how these lines are so simple, they wrap around, they just mimic the shape of the bottom of the cylinder. And now that we know the face works in a similar way, we can draw, say, the brows, the eye sockets here, the bottom of the nose mark is marked uh, at the bottom of this line here, and then the ears we know are the top of the ears match the brow line, and then the bottom of the ears match where the nose meets. So if you want to find the position of the ear, you just trace the shape around the cylinder of the head, and now your head will look correct in perspective. Uh, we would not only actually do this for the initial stages of the drawing, but a lot of the times the teacher of the class would come around halfway through the class when we've got our heads in and do a tracing of an abstraction on top of our drawings to show where we're off. They would show, oh, your ears or your nose, or your eyes are misaligned here. You can see I'll draw you know, the Riley abstraction on top. Anyway, so that led me into thinking about how it could be useful to caricature. Uh, when I wanted to uh, do an extreme exaggeration, especially at an extreme angle, uh, I found it helpful just in my own studio time, just because I had this experience with um, this traditional drawing technique, I found that I could apply that to the caricature and basically fix my caricature drawings. I like my caricatures to be fairly exaggerated, not super extremely so, uh, but I like them to have the ring of authenticity. I like them to be three-dimensionally valid, where it looks like they could exist in the real world and it wouldn't be like a misshapen mass. Uh, I just like that look. That's my personal taste. It's not the only way to draw caricature, but it's the way I, it's the one, the type of caricature that I respond to best when I see people doing stuff like that, where it looks super exaggerated, but everything matches up. The alignment is good. You know, the face doesn't look unintentionally wonky. Uh, that's a really good sketch to me, and that's what I wanted to reproduce. Uh, so that's how it basically leads into caricature. Uh, at this point, I'll see if there's uh, any questions here. Let's see. Yeah, no questions yet, so that's good. Everyone's just following along and watching. Uh, so um, what I'm going to do now is just for the rest of the time is take a look at some of my older and some newer caricature sketches and correct them. I'm going to use the Riley abstraction to uh, figure out where I could improve uh, the construction of the face. I would use this at the stage in my development where I've already drawn, say, a thumbnail sketch to figure out the exaggeration, and then I've done a rough sketch, or maybe the thumbnail sketch evolved into a rough sketch where it's more completed. Uh, there's a good likeness, hopefully, that's where I want it to be before I move on to the abstraction, is there has to be a good sound likeness. And the reason of doing the abstraction is not to get necessarily a better likeness, um, or even to improve the exaggeration. It's just to correct any weird drawing errors or misalignments that may have occurred in the rough sketch because I was kind of, you know, fast and sloppy. Because when I'm drawing in a, you know, when I'm in that frame of mind, I don't always think about every single variable when I'm drawing. I usually am just concentrating on likeness and exaggeration in the first couple stages. 
and the abstraction stage is where I then take that rough wonky sketch and make it unwonky, if that makes sense. So let's see, I've got, um, this is a real old sketch I did of uh, Chris Farley. And uh, I did this back in probably 2003. Man, let me get the original photo here. This is just actually a photo I took off of screen from the, like a Saturday Night Live commercial. Alrighty. And uh, and I've always liked it. I think it's a really good likeness. I actually I turned it into an oil painting, uh, to, you know, a little one about this big. Uh, but it does have some what you might call structural or symmetry problems, and it's more obvious when you uh, flip the image in reverse. And I do this all the time. I'm sure a lot of you guys do too. Whoop, not that way. Yeah, so when you rotate it, you just see things you just did not notice before, like how there is this great uh, feeling, these great contours over here with the puffed out cheeks, but it's not really reflected over here. This side, the right side, that side that's now on the right, uh, doesn't look nearly as uh, full and voluminous as the side on the left. It looks now like this the, these contours on the left are almost like a tumor. It's just they're almost like distortions of the of the face rather than part of the face. They don't look really natural anymore. So sometimes I'll do an abstraction tracing over a drawing in reverse like this because I can still see those problems, or I can flip it back. Uh, it depends just my mood of, for the day. So what I'll do actually here is just I'll leave it the way it is. I'll just leave it in reverse because it's really obvious where those errors are. Uh, Oh, and someone brings up a good question. Uh, Comics Legend says, aren't those imperfections in some characters what makes them interesting? Yeah, to a certain degree, I think so. And, you know, just style-wise, caricatures don't always have to be perfectly symmetrical and anatomical. If that's not your style, if that's not your thing, that's totally cool. Um, like I said before, it's just my personal preference. I don't like my faces to feel unbalanced and really asymmetrical unless it's necessary for the likeness. Like if somebody has, you know, a lazy eye or a, a weird tilt to an eye or a crooked smile, that's an asymmetry that's necessary and important for the likeness. And I'll reflect that in the abstraction. The abstraction will actually have those asymmetries in it, but I'll still connect those features up to each other to make sure they, there's like this rhythmical flow. Uh, Antonio says, yeah, in some cases the rough sketch looks pretty good. Yeah, um, I, I agree. It's like sometimes I like my rough sketches more than, than the finished painting because there is a risk every time you draw over it, to uh, you lose a little bit something, but you also might gain something depending on how good at you are at doing the abstraction. Um, now jumping a little bit ahead, which we're not really gonna deal with today, is what you do with the abstraction. Uh, when you've gotten an abstraction sketch with all those rhythms, the face literally is what it says. It's an abstract version of the head. It doesn't look like a person anymore. It's just like a robotic version. It's like a skeleton wireframe. What you would then do is then take the abstraction and your rough sketch and your original reference photo and retrace over the abstraction with correct contour lines. So the triangle that you draw that is uh, you know representing say the nose you know in the abstraction version you know that's just a real bad rudimentary version of a nose uh, you would then draw on top of that the proper contour lines, but you can be confident now that they'll be in the right place and they'll be the right size and they'll be correct in relation to everything else. Anyway, so that's how I use the abstraction. Uh, let's see, Dimrault asks, I also love it when it's balanced, that's why I mentioned having difficulties with the abstraction a couple of streams ago. Yeah. So anyway, let us just go ahead and jump in on this here. I'll keep my original reference photo open. I, you know what though, since it's, uh, since I flipped the, uh, the drawing, I might as well flip the uh, reference. Although it's not that important, I'm not actually looking to um, stick too closely to what's there. Um, this is the, the tricky part about doing an abstraction trace over on top of your rough sketch is that you run the risk of just tracing over the exact same thing you did without doing any corrections. And I have a suggestion for those of you who that applies to. Uh, my first suggestion would be just to try it, just keep on doing it and try to ignore what's there while referring to what's there. I mean, you don't stick to it like a slave, just, you know, don't just draw what's there and just trace over the exact same things again. Uh, try to just 
put the drawing physically into the background, and I like to dim it down here so I can just barely see it, <clears throat> and, um, and just pretend you're redrawing it like a perfect robot version of that. You know, if it's the head's a sphere or a cylinder, draw the sphere, draw the cylinder, and draw the center line on top of that. So if I were to say do it off on the side here, I'd find the center line, find the lines for the eyes. The head's tilted downwards, so the contour lines sort of go upward. Got a real short nose, but again, it wraps around the side of the egg. The mouth, again, really close to the nose, and you don't really have to trace that around to the side because it's just a mouth. Uh, and so I'm thinking along these terms here. I'm thinking of this egg shape, and I'm only doing it very, very loosely on top of the original drawing and not trying to, again, reproduce exactly what's there. Okay, so with that in mind, I'm going to do a proper abstraction now. And the way I like to start is with the head shape because I think it is the most important. And I'm just going to simplify everything. I'm not going to draw any contours. I want to draw real simple C curves and straight lines, maybe some S curves here and there, but generally straight lines and gentle sloping. So I, I got almost a perfect egg shape here, maybe a little narrower at the top, but that's fine. You know, I'm not trying to actually draw a chicken egg, uh, but it is reminiscent of an egg. And if there's places where on the original sketch it, it veered off from that egg shape where maybe there was too much of a bulge on one side, I'll just ignore that because what I am trying to do is smooth it out and perfect it uh, with this stage. Okay, after I've got the initial head shape, uh, I like to find the center line. And in this uh, reference photo here, it's actually, you know, I want to say it's actually slightly to the, uh, yeah, the head is actually tilted such, so downward, the chin is tucked in, uh, that the center line is actually kind of, it's a little non-intuitive, it's going sort of uh, crooked like so. And that's... I, uh, it's a little dicey to do that right now because now the egg looks very funky. It doesn't really look, you know, it doesn't look like it's a perfectly spheroid egg. Uh, so what I might want to do is readjust the shape of the head so that it feels more balanced with the center line because I know the center line is what I want to stick with uh, because it's, that's most correct to what I see in the photo. Uh, so Anthony asks, so the rhythm of the Riley method follows the expression, right? For example, the cheek that becomes a ball when the subject is smiling. Yes, uh, you do adjust the Riley rhythms uh, for the expression that the person is making because extreme expressions can drastically change uh, the geometry of the face, especially a you know, really open mouth um, or a big smile like this. The forms will definitely change, yeah. Uh, so it is, that's why the Riley rhythm, or the Riley method does work so well for caricature because it's so adaptable. It's not based on perfectly measuring out the distances between things like the Loomis head. You know, the Loomis head, if you look at it straight on, uh, the corners of the mouth line up perfectly with, say, the inside is, insides of the, I think, of the iris, and the, uh, you know, nostrils, the wings of the nose line up with the inside corners of the eyes. But that's for a neutral expression. The, the Loomis method and those, those divisions, those measurements, don't work when the person's making an extreme expression. Uh, the Riley rhythms help you find those, uh, those proportions in a really simplified way. So let me uh, bring the ball out over here to the right a little bit so that the center line feels a little more balanced. And already you can see how I'm actually changing the exaggeration and shape of the head a little bit, and that's good, that's okay. I think it's going to end up being a more balanced looking caricature as a result. It just feels more correct now. Since the center line is a little bit more to the left of the head, it's natural to see more uh, of the right, right side of the shape of the cranium. So I think uh, what's happening here is the fact that I did this um, outer head shape here on the left to match the distorted bloated cheeks on the left 
forced me to make the head wider over here to account for that. So now I'm getting to the place where I can see that I'm going to get that sense of volume on the right side of the face that I was missing before. Hi, Shriyas, welcome. All right, and now I can see with this center line here that the eye right here is, n is way farther than this eye from the center line. The eye on the right, if you can't see my cursor here. So what I want to do to make it a little more correct is either bring this eye in or on the right or bring the eye on the left further out. Usually what I like to find though next, before actually finding the individual features and their placement, is the divisions of thirds of the face. You know, from the hairline to the brow, brow to the bottom of the nose, nose to the bottom of the chin. In a standard portrait in the Loomis method, uh, those will be equal thirds. And that's what we usually do when we're drawing portraits, is we draw those equal thirds first. Uh, here we're actually not using the center lines to find equal thirds, we're using this, these center lines of the features to uh, uh, find basically just the angle of the features so that they all line up with one another and they're parallel. Now if you want to do a caricature where something isn't parallel for whatever reason, again, a crooked nose, crooked mouth, crooked eyes, that's fine, make those lines crooked, but plan it out. Don't let it be a result of an accident. All right, and for the mouth, I'm going to basically find corner to corner. Really close to the mouth here. I'm sorry, really close to the nose, I should say. And there is more of a bend to the mouth, but I'm not drawing the bend of the mouth yet. I'm just drawing the alignment of the mouth. Okay, so, oh, and then the bottom of the chin. Uh, since I am exaggerating the heaviness of his features, I'm going to leave a lot more space underneath the chin. I like the placement of the chin in the original rough sketch, and that's going to be right there, and everything beneath that is going to be neck. So here's our egghead Chris Farley right now without the uh, rough sketch. So frequently you might want to get rid of your rough sketch to see how the abstraction is progressing uh, to make sure you're not just tracing over the landmarks from the original sketch, you want to make sure you're improving upon them. All right, so let's begin with the abstraction proper here. Uh, a really important rhythm, which if I could show my diagram, in fact, you know what, let me go ahead and open, I can actually open the PDF in Photoshop rather than um, relying on the viewing software here, just so you know what we're dealing with. So there we go. I'll just uh, keep that diagram exposed. Is that getting in the way of my head? Yeah, that's pretty good. Okay. Um, so the next rhythm I often like to do is either the brow, you know, the eyebrow rhythm, or the ch cheek to chin. Uh, the cheek to which, oh, they sorry, the ear to chin is the ear. The top of the ear connects with the bottom of the chin and runs along the ridge of the zygomatic arch. And on his face, you can't really see a zygomatic arch. There's no bone showing because there's so much facial fat. But I can see generally it's, it's like that here in the original reference photo. What, you're connecting the top of the ear to the chin along a C curve. And that's what I want to find here. Of course, it's now caricatured, so it's not going to be the exact same angle in distance. Uh, but I'm going to be basing it off of the rough sketch. And the one on this side is a little trickier because it, it sort of wraps around. But what I want it to do is make sure it essentially just mirrors this, this V-shape created between the center line and this ear to chin rhythm. I want it mirrored on this side. And I can see that it's actually not. It's a little too far. There we go. And then it kind of wraps around because it's, um, it's following around the contours of the egg. You know, if I was drawing these, you know, in cutting lines into an actual egg or drawing lines across an egg, well, I'm not sure it would exactly look like this, but I'm doing my best. I'm just trying to extrapolate into three dimensions from two. All right, Anthony asks, uh, at this stage I'm struggling because I feel I tend to follow what's under. I don't understand how you manage to correct the angles. I mean, you have to know what is wrong or right already. Um, well, like I just said, uh, maybe just you wrote that before I said this, is make sure that these angles are mirror images of each other. 
rather than following exactly what's there. So I, I liked this rhythm here. This was easy to find, the, the rhythm on the right side of the face, from the ear, top of the ear, down to the bottom of the chin. And that made it now a little easier to find the rhythm on the left side, because all I had to do is you know, make sure the distance from here to here is equal, and the distance from here to here is equal, and the distance from here to here is roughly equal. Um, so now I'm, I'm correcting what's there without just repeating those same mistakes. Does that make sense? Uh, JDK asks, would it make any sense to trace the abstraction over the original draft first and then manipulate the abstraction to keep some of the original gesture, the exaggeration, or is that an extra step? You could try it. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, Stan asks, what the, oh, <laughs> all right, yeah, it looks like you're maybe watching two streams there, Stan. Yeah, okay. Um, no worries. Uh, so yeah, so if you do still have trouble um, with doing an abstraction tracing over your drawing, another technique you might try is not tracing the, the original rough sketch. Uh, let me show you something else here real quick. It's uh, redrawing it just from scratch, but while having the original next to you. So let me shrink that down a little bit so you have a little more room. So you can try this. For those of you who have trouble with this concept of retracing over it without just repeating the same mistakes, um, you can start with a real basic, maybe just find the, the height and the width. Um, you know, maybe even just the whole head shape, perhaps. No, actually, that's going too far. So what I would just recommend, find the height, the width, yeah, maybe, no, not even so, yeah, just, just do that much, just so you get the general proportions. And then you can move it to the side and then draw your abstraction based on the reference photo and based on your rough sketch. But now you won't be influenced at all by those corrections because you're essentially redrawing it from scratch. You're, not, you're now drawing or I'm drawing like this perfect egg shape. And looking at the reference photo, I can find that center line again here. And I can look and find the angles of the eyes. And so everything now I'm just guessing. I'm just redrawing my rough sketch in an abstract form without tracing it. So I found the, uh, the center line of the eyes, the bottom of the nose, the angle of the mouth, and I guess uh, here's the bottom of the chin. And uh, since the head's looking down, I would actually find the top of the ears here by wrapping this contour line around to the sides. Same thing with the nose. Make sure these lines stay parallel. And now I've got the placement and size of the ears right up here. Now I can find the top of the ear down to the side of the chin. And see how it's a lot less confusing now. I can see just the rhythms. I can't see the drawing underneath and I'm just drawing it like literally right next to it. The problem though, the, r the risk you run by doing this is that you may really lose the likeness or the charm of the original rough sketch because now you're drawing a whole new caricature, an abstract version of the same caricature, but those little tiny decisions that made the rough sketch work well, maybe they won't work well anymore. Uh, maybe you'll, it'll just lose some of that quality. But it's something, like I said, you could try if you're having trouble with the uh, tracing aspect. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Actually, I haven't shown the actual drawing of the um, Riley rhythms in the, with the tracing method here, but you get the idea. You know, the, the muzzle rhythm. Make sure it matches from side to side. So you can better judge symmetry this way without, you know, without the original drawing coming into play. So hopefully that makes sense. All right, so let's go back to the original one because this is the way I actually wanted to show how to do it. Alrighty. 
So I might as well find the correct placement of the ear, which is, is a step I sort of skipped, I guess, before I did the ear to chin rhythm. Probably should have done the uh, uh, wrapping the brow rhythm around the side of the head first. And that would have given me my correct ear placement. But it's, it's pretty close, I think. But if it's not, then all this will actually re will reveal if on my rough sketch the uh, ear is in the wrong size or place. And it does look like it. You know, I have, it's pretty close, but say the earlobe you can see here is a little bit below that line. Not a huge deal, but if, I want, if I'm being correct, and actually it should come out here now, uh, this is the rough placement and size of the ear for this caricature. And you can't see the ear on the other side because it just wraps around too much. And I'm going to sort of ignore the hair for right now. The hair is a really prominent feature and it's covering up a lot of his head, but it's not important for the structure right now. Uh, next, let's find the um, brow rhythm. And that's just connecting the outer edge of the uh, eyebrow with the other outer edge of the other eyebrow. And it does usually meet, well, I, I wouldn't say always, but it looks like here like it's going to meet the ear to chin rhythm fairly well. And I draw across the center line to make sure it's symmetrical. And I want to make sure it has about roughly the same width on the other side, taking the perspective into account. So I think the, uh, the initial brow line there was a little high. There we go. And it's not an extreme arch. On some people, especially if they're raising or arching their eyebrows, uh, this is going to be a much, you know, it'll be a line more like that. But since Mr. Farley here is running his head downward uh, and he's got his brows are forming a deep V, it's not going to be a very uh, high or tall rhythm here. Now let's find the bottoms of the eye sockets, which usually line up with the bottom bags of the eyes. When you scrunch it up, you can see the, the bags where the tops of the cheeks meet the, uh, yeah, for lack of a better word, the eye bags. Uh, so and that's going to also connect with the outer ridge of the outer um, landmark of the eyebrow. And see, I'm just making, I'm trying to make a perfect like these two shapes actually come together to form a sort of a football shape, an American football, sort of this oblong ovoid shape with pointy ends. All right. And often now is a good time to find the separation or the distance between the two eyes. Uh, looking at his caricature, you know, and looking at my, I'm sorry, looking at his uh, photo, looking at my caricature, uh, of him, the rough, the rough sketch, I can see the eye on the left is a little too close to the center line and the eye on the right is a little too far. So I'm going to sort of split the difference. And I don't think he has eyes that are necessarily wider or you know more separated or more close together than the average. However, if I want to make the effect of sort of, you know, heaviness, you know, heavy set look on his face look more prominent, I could make the eyes a little closer together, which allows for more space on the outsides of the eyes, giving the effect of sort of a fatter face. Uh, but it's risky, you know, if he doesn't really have super close together eyes, it might, uh, might hurt the likeness a little bit. But anyway, I'm just going to make a little notch here for where the inside corner of the eye on the right is, and then the eye on the inside corner of the eye on the left. And I want to make sure they're equidistant from the center line. Uh, now, he actually has pretty uh, upward slanted eyes, and it's, it's partly due to his likeness, but also due to the fact that he's turning his head down, it's going to make the eyes look more slanted. So the outside corners of the eyes are going to be higher than the inside corners. So what I'll do is find the upper lid. Upper lid over here. And then I can actually connect the two lids by actually drawing another rhythm from left to right across the center line over here. And this will help make sure the eyes stay symmetrical because I'm drawing one continuous rhythm line from left to right. And it's going to be it's going to be a lot more easy to line up those eyes when you're drawing both eyes together at the same time, if that makes sense. That's what we're doing when we're drawing bilateral features with an abstraction. We're 
drawing them both at once, essentially, by drawing one continuous line. And when you draw one shape connected, it's easier to make sure they flow into each other properly. Okay. Let's see how this compares. I can actually just remove it for a second. Yeah, the position of the eyes has really changed. Um, they're a lot higher up than they were before, which I don't know how I feel about that. It actually may be a little... You know, you know what actually I did? I think I might have... No, not, yeah, that's what I did with the abstraction. That's how I laid it in. Uh, so yeah, uh, I am drifting off the original drawing quite a bit. And it's scary to do that because you think you might lose the likeness. And I might. Uh, but what I am going to get is a really correct looking egghead version of Chris Farley. Uh, and I just have to have faith in the process that it's going to work. So I'm just going to continue boldly forward. Um, now let's find the rhythms of his actual eyebrows. And I'm going to do it in one continuous sort of C stroke from left to right. Again, trying to make sure that it's a symmetrical shape from left to right, given the perspective of the head, the fact that it's turned a little bit. So there's going to be, uh, you know, we're going to see more of the eyebrows on the right side of the face than we will on the left. It's going to be a little bit of a longer line. And then another rhythm, and sort of outer brow rhythm for the shape of the brow over here. And that's where, you know, the tail of the eyebrow rests, which is usually just on the outside of the temple. And the temple rhythm is this circular rhythm that you can see here on the original uh, diagram here. And it's just a circle. But it, yeah, it usually lines up with where the eyebrow uh, peaks and then transforms into the tail. And his hair is covering up a lot of this, but if there's any skin showing, which it does on a lot of people, it will help you figure out where you need to turn the form, where you need to change your shading from light to dark uh, if you're going to be painting it or shading this. I don't know, let's see what the questions are here now. Um, do you flip your sketch horizontally or vertically to see with a fresh perspective, uh, Schwabel asks. Yeah, I did. Um, I actually did on this. I don't know, you may have missed the beginning of the stream, but... Uh, I'm actually doing this entire abstraction in reverse from what it originally was. And it definitely, yeah, helps me see the, the asymmetries. Uh, Anthony asks, uh, happens sometimes to you after this stage of Riley method to end up with something where you lose the likeness and have to restart again? Yes, you, the, the, the Riley abstraction won't have a likeness. You're just going to have to accept that. <laughs> uh, you, you might, you might be able to see depending on how much detail you put in it, but all it is is for to help you put the placement of your features in your final drawing, which you're going to trace on top of the abstraction. And the final drawing after the abstraction is where you get the likeness back with all the features now in their proper perspective and anatomy and alignment. Uh, what about the size of the eyes, Gustavo asks. In that position, one has to be larger than the other. Uh, yeah, and I think I, think I have. Um, if you notice here, the eye on the right is, is significantly bigger than the one on the left. The one on the left, he's actually seems a little more squinty, which I think is also reflected in my abstraction drawing here. Uh, and that maybe was unintentional or unconscious because I'm just, I am reacting to what is happening there. Uh, so I am taking that into account a little bit as I draw because if you don't, you, yeah, you might run the risk of losing little things like that. Um, but like I said, when you do the tracing of your final drawing on top of this, uh, you will have a chance to reshape these features uh, to be a little bit more individual to the person again. And then uh, it just you'll be more confident though that they're in the right place. Uh, hey, hello, Shiny. Thanks for joining again. Uh, yeah, it's early for you. Sorry about that. Uh, Keys said, does the Riley method always result in a more natural look? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Um, as I mentioned before, the Riley abstraction will get you a very robotic geometric drawing. It doesn't look natural at all. Uh, but hopefully if you do it correctly and you use it in the way that helps you get correct perspective, then yes, your final drawing will be a lot more natural looking. You just have to retrace it, basically. You have to retrace it with natural contours. Uh, is there any book on the Riley method? Uh, Shreyas asks. Not that I've seen. Uh, there's a couple ones out there that, that do address it, that talk about it, but not the drawings aren't, you know, I, I don't know. I don't want to criticize other artists' work, but there was a student of Riley uh, Frank Faragasso, I think his name was. 
Fargasso or Farragasso. And there's a lot in there about the, the rhythms, but I don't know, the application that he puts in there, to the way he applies the abstraction to his own drawings doesn't result in, I think, drawings that are very inspiring to look at. And the way it's written, I, you know, it's, it's very dense, it's hard to get through. Uh, I never read a book on it, I just learned it at art school. <laughs> so um, I learned it in a very practical application. So sort of like I'm showing here, I'm demoing it, and then, you know, you might go try it yourself, and that's how I learned the abstraction. Anyway, let's continue on. I don't want to talk for too much here. Um, I'm going to find the front plane of the nose now, and this rhythm's a little more just based on, you know, I'm just drawing it here. I'm just sort of freehanding and imagining the front plane of the nose sitting off from the front plane of the face. So it's going to, you know, slope out a little bit, and I'm taking that into account. This is the one where it's a little, it's not quite as, you know, there's not a lot to go on geometrically here. I'm just redrawing it uh, freehand and hoping for the best. Oops. Yeah, so I just want us to keep this to the front plane, not the nostrils. This is just the, you know, the bridge of the nose down to the ball of the nose. And in this angle, he has nostrils are up higher than the ball of his nose. His ball of his nose is pointed downward, so that's an important, important part of his likeness and for the structure of the anatomy. So I want to take that into account. I'm going to draw the bottom plane of the nose here as I see it in the reference photo. And not relying on the original drawing because I'm just, it's really shifting now, as you can see. So there's the nose on the original. Here's my nose here. Uh, I'm now just referring mostly to my abstraction and what kind of, what size and placement of nose makes sense for the abstraction that I've drawn here. So I'm taking into account the position of the, the rhythm lines from the, the ear to chin rhythms on both sides. I want to make sure the nostrils are equidistant from that. And then I'm going to draw nose from one side to the other. See, remember, it's always good to connect the features from one side of the center line to the other so that they are symmetrical. And I might even want to dip the bottom plane of the nose down a little further. This will be sort of the underside of the nose that's, that we can sort of see in the reference photo. There we go. Uh, Butch says there's some Riley Rhythm stuff in Doran's book, The Artist's Atelier, but it's a bit like reading stereo instructions. Yeah, that's what I found with the Faragasso book too. Um, I find it's best taught in a situation like this, where a teacher is demonstrating the concepts, talking about it, showing you, you asking questions. It's really the best way to learn. Books are okay, but um, I've never really read most of my art books. I just look at the pictures mostly. Uh, unless it's like anatomy, where I'm actually reading about the, uh, the structures as well, because you kind of need to read for that. But um, yes, yeah, so this is a real practical type method, and um, getting it from a book is not the best way. Uh, with that in mind, actually, this, this PDF here that, uh, that I tried to share earlier, but I couldn't show all the different pages because, well, it's, uh, if I do, you know, I won't have sound. But I do give a step-by-step -step breakdown in this document about how to draw these Riley rhythms, like which one to start with, you know, how to draw the connections between them, and I highlight it in a step-by-step. -step. I think it's like a 12-step process. And uh, if you are a premium member of the caricature course, the Proco caricature course, you'll get this ebook, uh, this PDF. Uh, back to the rhythms here. Uh, the rhythms are going to get you. Uh, let's find the, uh, you know, a really, really important rhythm is the muzzle rhythm. And that, if I can highlight it on the diagram here, that's the rhythm from the um, root of the nose here. Uh, yeah, it's kind of hard to see because I'm just retracing it in gray, but uh, outlines the cheek fat pad and goes down to the jowl and bottom of the chin. Muzzle rhythm is really, really important in structuring the face, especially a chubby one. Uh, that has you know really prominent cheeks, and the rhythm is going to be distorted based on the fact that he's making this huge smile. But I'm going to start here at the base of the nose, the root of the nose, down below the bags of the eyes, and it's going to cross over the uh, zygomatic area. And you know, on a face like this, it's you know, you can. 
you can choose if you want to make it come all the way down to the bottom of the uh, neck or what might be more appropriate is just to have the rhythm go back to the chin which is what it's supposed to do in my original in my original diagram so so it's not really a C curve anymore it's the cheek rhythm is doing or the muzzle rhythm is doing something like this if you were to take it out and look at it separately so it's a little bit of a compound shape which I don't like to do too much but I think it's necessary for this particular expression uh, it's simple enough though to recreate I think it's not too complicated so I'm just going to run that rhythm over here and it's going to go I think all the way to the contour over here the outside contour of the face and meet down back with the chin again and that is the muzzle rhythm is what we call that Now let's find the uh, the I guess the zyg or what do you call it the um, the laugh the rhythm of the laugh line for laugh for lack of a better word the nasal labial fold the nasal labial rhythm I guess <laughs> uh, and again if this person is making a um, neutral expression it's going to be sort of a oval or egg shaped rhythm uh, but here he's got a lot of cheek fat and it's going to distort that rhythm and follow along the crease where he smiles and then it's going to the form is going to be interrupted by the chin here which pushes up and then reconnects the same way on this side and again I'm now I'm trying to make sure that the nasal labial rhythm here intersects at the exact same places on the left as it does on the right you can see all three rhythms intersect right here the the bottom of the nose rhythm or you know it's just more of a guideline than anything else not really a rhythm uh, and then the ear to chin rhythm and then the nasal labial rhythm meets right there so it's right at this point there so look for those landmarks and it'll help you draw these things more symmetrically and if I was doing this with pencil or with charcoal this would be a lot cleaner of a drawing <laughs> I've got a lot of hairy sketchy lines here try to do that as little as possible you want to try to do it in one stroke or one flowing line if you can uh, it's just a little different it's a little less control that you get with a uh, with a stylus on a tablet here uh, Anthony says I'm struggling to put this rhythm uh, in because I'm struggling to see it in the photo ref uh, right it's it's not always exactly obvious but it's not um, again we're not tracing the exact plane changes of everything like you might see in a normal wireframe diagram where the rhythm lines are are there to uh, there a lot of it's invisible on the surface what you're doing is drawing the connections between the visible landmarks um, and along the way you will find places that will have a plane change like say this curve right here on the bottom outside of the mouth area that definitely is a plane change area uh, and it also happens to connect you know the, the ball of the cheek right here to the ball of the chin so some of these things you have to kind of take on faith and just memorize the diagram in its sort of natural generic portrait state and learn how to apply it to a caricature so it's a thing where you have to practice the, the, the diagram you have to practice the Riley abstraction a few times before it'll get burned into memory and you'll just regurgitate those onto the faces of the caricatures you're drawing uh, see comics legend says is there a price special pricing for your premium course at this time um, I'm not sure if there's a discount going on right now but uh, because of COVID-19 and everyone staying at home uh, I think Stan is offering an extended free preview uh, normally the free preview I'm not sure how long it is it might be like a few days or a week uh, I think there's a 30-day free, pre free preview right now of the course where you can decide if you want to pay for it uh, where you get full access to the course so maybe sign up for that um, and if you do like it you know and want to go through all the videos I would appreciate it if you did actually purchase it uh, because right now that's my uh, main source of income right now is that course uh, I'm not working at all right now except for a few commissions here and there and my Proco course is actually uh, helping pay my mortgage uh, yeah so I think there was actually a question um, on Facebook when uh, one of my friends asked when, when I solicited um, topics for this live stream so she suggested talking about how I'm you know uh, working as an artist right now in these times where maybe there's not a lot of work going on right now and um, yeah you know I am there's some things I have sort of on the back burner that I'm planning as far as like you know making prints available or uh, getting an online store sh set up um, but until then uh, really my only source of income is my Proco course 
So um, I'm in a good situation there, but um, as long as coming in. Uh, but uh, definitely give it a look. You know, if you don't like it and don't think it's for you, don't, you know, no pressure at all, that's, that's fine. But uh, I would recommend uh, people uh, buy the premium course if they really want in-depth lessons and all this stuff because I do go into a lot of detail on the premium videos. There's a lot of extra bonus videos where I do this kind of thing where I'm drawing lots of examples and explaining the entire time. I'm putting the main lessons, the free lessons, into perspective uh, in real-world situations. Uh, Dimrold asks, every shape created by these rhythms has to be cut into equal parts by the center line, right? Uh, yeah, uh, if I think what you're asking is you, you want each of these rhythms on either side of the center line to look like a mirror image of what's on the other side. Uh, but taking into account the fact that it's an ex, uh, you know, a, a head that's tilted or it's a head that's in, um, in perspective so it's turned away from us a little bit. And if I have time, I actually have another uh, extreme angle I'd like to draw. So I'm going to continue on this and hopefully get to another example that shows a more extreme uh, angle uh, that will, the, uh, the, the, the Riley rhythms will help me draw. So anyway, here's the front plane of the chin. That's the chin rhythm, which is sort of mimicking what the mentalis, the shape of the mentalis muscle. It's that muscle that pushes up your lower lip when you um, make a pouty face. And it, it's not a you know, super important for the overall structure, but for that feature, yes, you have to realize there is a distinct plane right there. Um, there are there's a minor rhythm called the node, uh, the, uh, the nodiolus. Uh, which is the intersection of all your muscle fibers at the corners of your mouth, and they usually keep the the laugh lines, the nasal labial fold, from touching the corners of the mouth. And there are little uh, ovoid shapes right here. And actually, I can see that there's more space over here than on the left side than there is on the right. So that's good that I actually did this. I had the corner of the mouth here, and the corner of the mouth shouldn't be in the node. It needs to be just uh, on the inside edge of that node. And now I can probably draw the rhythm line for the actual mouth, which is a bit of a grin. All right, let's uh, get some pupils in there, or irises. And there's no real rhythms. I mean, there are rhythms for the body, but here it's just basically a... Uh, uh, you know, caricature portrait that's sort of vignetted, but I'll I'll draw the collar and the shoulders a little bit here because they do help show his body type and his mass. So here's the the collar of his shirt, which you can't really see in the photo reference, but it's something like like that. And I'm just trying to draw them in a simplified, abstract way. I'm just not getting too specific. Um, and you know what the you know what I, what I really like about this? Um, I'm going to redraw this one here now that I'm looking at it more analytically. Uh, I want to raise this back collar quite a bit. What you could do to make sure that the back collar or the shoulders match is actually draw a rhythm from one side of the head to the other so there's a continuous line. There we go. Now the that's actually more correct to the photo and it's kind of a funnier caricature because now it looks like he has more, just a lot more mass. And here's maybe the fold of the collar. There's his shoulder. Just makes them look more massive. There we go. And so we now we've got this extra rhythm line, you know, cutting through the face, which makes it a little messier, but uh, it does help draw that uh, the collar of the shirt more accurately. Okay, and it's almost done here. Um, there are a few other rhythms I could put in, but it's not super important for the likeness. Uh, I'm just going to finish off with the hair here. And I can't see the top of his head, but I imagine it's... Let's see. Yeah, I, I, in the original refer, in the original character sketch too, I had some trouble figuring out where his hair was parted. It almost looks like it's parted on the side that's on the right here, but it kind of doesn't make sense when you get over to the left. It's just very feathery. So anyway, I'll just I'll just keep it simple. There we go. And the, the rhythm for the, the bangs or the, the fringe, you know, the, the front of his hair, um, sort of mimics the, the, the flow of the eyebrows. But now there's a lot more space on the other side here by his ear than I had in the original drawing. I had that hairline really, really close to his eyes. 
and now it's a little further out. And the hair also feathers out behind the ears. And something like so. All right, so now here we have our Chris Farley abstraction. Let's get rid of the original reference or the original sketch. And now I can do a tracing on top of this, which I'm not going to do here because that's a whole different lesson. That's actually lesson five of the Proco course. Lesson four is doing the abstraction, and lesson five is doing uh, the, the, the final drawing on top of the abstraction. So check that out. It's on YouTube on the Proco channel for free. Uh, if you want to see what the next stage is after this and how I would then correct this and make bring the likeness back. And I do think there is a sort of rudimentary likeness here. It's, 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 it, it's been genericized a little bit because it's so geometric and perfect. Uh, but it feels a lot more correct than the original uh, than the original sketch did, which is over here. Let's get rid of that. Let's compare the two. Yeah, so it definitely changed quite a bit, as you can see. Um, now, it would be interesting to see how well I did by doing a final drawing on top of this. You, you'll look at this abstraction and say, you know, you lost the likeness court, and I agree, it's not really there anymore, but that's what happens. That's to be expected in this drawing, because it's not a representation of his likeness, it's a representation of the construction of his face, as it ideally should be, with caricatured proportions. I just didn't draw the exact features, the right shapes yet. That comes in the next step. And that's what I talk about when I say you got to just have faith in the process. This is a fundamental technique that helps me get better drawings. And I believe it would work when I do a tracing of that. And you know, maybe I'll do it off camera and show it on Facebook or something when I'm done. <clears throat> All right, let's see a couple questions here. Uh, Keith asks, I saw some of your tutorials where you gave feedback on send-in drawings. Are you planning on doing something like that again maybe? Um, those student critiques were part of the original run of the course and those student critiques are actually all filmed and accessible so you can watch these other students critiques but yeah I'm not technically doing full critiques like that anymore I mean if you do contact me or post stuff on Facebook and ask for my help or, or a comment or something I'll definitely try to uh, you know get on it and give you some advice um, that's just you know it's part of the it's part of the deal uh, so definitely post stuff in the caricature Proco Facebook group um, or contact me at Court Jones Studio on Facebook, which is my professional page, and, uh, and I'll try to you know, give you whatever advice I can. Um, but it won't be maybe as detailed or as involved as the critiques that I did for the Proco course. Jim says, knowing the muscles and tendons for different expressions seems really useful. Did you learn them formally or did you pick it up intuitively? I learned them formally, thank you for asking. Uh, I mentioned, I think, in previous live casts that I actually uh, used to teach features, uh, facial anatomy and facial expressions at the Watts School. Um, it's where I learned all about the Riley Method as well. It's what they teach there. And uh, I was asked to actually teach the, the expressions and anatomy course without ever having taken it. So I had to teach myself, basically reading Elliot Goldfinger and a couple other books. Uh, I learned all the muscles of the face, the fat pads of the face, the bones of the face. Yeah, and all that stuff goes into understanding what the... Um, what the Riley abstraction is and why it looks the way it does. Um, in the premium section of the Proco course, there actually is uh, a detailed breakdown of how I construct or how I understand the Riley abstraction based on my knowledge of the anatomy, where I talk about the muscles, the, the bony features and landmarks, and the, and the fat pads especially are a big player in the uh, construction of the Riley rhythms. Um, so if you watch that premium video, you'll actually get a better, deeper understanding of why these rhythms are where they're at and why they're shaped the way they are. Uh, Lar says, this is the corrected frame to hang the sketch back onto. Just marvelous. Yes, exactly. That's a great way to look at it. You're just, it's a framework. It's like the, the frame of a house that you have to now build the house back up onto. The, the original rough sketch is sort of like the, the concept drawing for the house, if you will. But it's not properly structured yet. You've got to build the framework of the house before you can hang the curtains on it. How long does this step take you in your daily work? Um, well, yeah, I did it real slow here because I was talking while I was working on it. But, um, you know, with, within 10 minutes probably I can do an abstraction that's pretty, you know, accurate and tight. So, yeah, it doesn't take... All right, so let's go ahead and move. i got a few other faces here that um, I prepared. I don't think I'll have time to do them all. 
Um, then I did a, uh, this is my old sketch of Hayao Miyazaki that I really liked. Uh, I've already flipped it in reverse, but I don't think I'm going to do that. Um, Here's a Marilyn I recently did. Again, I also flipped it. So actually I can see how her eyes are misaligned here. Uh, they actually didn't look... See, it looked a lot better than my original. Here's my the original uh, I did of Marilyn. Uh, but when I flipped it over, I could see a lot of those inconsistencies. Um, but the one I really want to do and spend the rest of my time on here, I think, is the uh, this one here. Ah, sorry. Sorry to scare you there. It's a pretty big Trump. But he has a really great extreme expression, or sorry, extreme angle here, and I think, which I think is great to practice the abstraction on. Uh, JDK says, yes, I can see how important it is to get that center line right. It will affect everything. That's totally it. It's like the most important line in that abstraction is the center line. Everything's based off of it. So make the correct judgment call on that center line and you'll be good. Or it'll be a lot easier anyway. Uh, Husky says, my audio and camera stutters sometimes. Oh, sorry about that. Um, yeah, it could just be my video capture card. I'm not sure. Um, it probably just cuts out for a second. Uh, hopefully it doesn't last too long. If it lasts you know, a long time and you lose the audio, let me know. All right, so let's go ahead and do an abstraction of Mr. Trump here. I was looking through my portfolio and I really don't have any new paintings of Trump. I've got one that I did of the um, from the character course. It's more of a black and white rendered drawing than anything. It's not really a painting, but um, it's crazy. It's been this long and I haven't done a brand new Trump. I, my, my older Trump drawing was like from, or painting was from like 10 years ago. So here we go. Um, let's first figure out the head shape. And I see his head is sort of diamond shaped, you know, narrower at the top, um, wide, tapering down because of his, uh, because of the collar. Um, I mean, it's 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 square-ish, but it's also sort of diamond shaped, I think. And looking at it without the uh, without the uh, sketch underneath, it's a bit wonky. Actually, I don't like that shape. I, I think I, what I want to do is maybe round out the head on the left side a little bit more so it matches the right. So, so my initial line there, my initial head shape was basically just tracing what I had. And then I stopped and I checked it. And I'm like, no, I need to redraw that. And that's the first stage of the corrections. Yeah, now it feels more... Uh, anatomically or, you know, more symmetrical. Hello, Anubroto from India. Thanks for joining. Hello, Digital Island from Puerto Rico. <clears throat> okay, so uh, the center line. Uh, looking at the original reference photo, if I want to stay accurate to that, the center line is sort of at this angle here, 10 or 15 degrees off center, I guess, or off vertical. There we go. So he's looking almost straight at us, just turned upward and just to the side a little bit. So there's going to be more space on the right side than there will be on the left. Um, here's an opportunity to, I, I can actually change the uh, exaggeration just a little bit. I think it'll be a little funnier with more neck showing and less chin. So I think the bottom of the chin is going to be there, not, not this line. That line down there, that's what I'm thinking. It should be up here, actually. So that's basically the main plane change from from top to bottom. And then there's like a bit of a ridge here, sort of a where it turns away from us. That's uh, you know the the front bottom plane of the chin. Okay, so let us find the brow rhythm. And I'm making, trying to make sure that the lines are as perpendicular as they can be. You know, it's forming like a perfect cross. That's how you know it's at the right angle. 
Um, now it's a per it's a perpendicular cross in perspective. You know the the head is if this was a cube in perspective. That's sort of what I'm thinking of. So the center line is going to be like that, and then the brow line is going to be like that. So it looks perpendicular, but not you know in the true sense where it's just facing right at us. So you got to keep in mind the perspective that you're drawing it at, and think of it like this cube first, or a cylinder, or a or a sphere. Uh, Raul says, thanks for the live stream. Any chance this will be played again? Yes, this will be archived on my YouTube channel here. As soon as it's done being live, it will just be there forever. So you can play it back at double speed so it goes faster. <laughs> All right, let's find the, um, the axis of the eyes. Aha, and here I can already see that the eye on the right was drawn too low on the original sketch. If I'm trying to stay perpendicular to the eyebrows anyway. So that's good that I sell that. Uh, also the nose, uh, I'm going to draw the, um, the line from nostril to nostril. And then the mouth. Finding the angle of the mouth itself. Not the curvature of the mouth, that's going to come later. But I just want to draw the straight line first because that will help make sure that uh, the features are symmetrical in, on this face or on um, they're aligned correctly with each other. Uh, Leonardo asks, is the initial shape, is it always a round shape? No, no, not at all. It depends on the level of exaggeration of your original thumbnail and your rough sketch. If I were drawing someone, oh, I don't know, like, uh, like Bill Nye, I did a sketch of him. Oh, you know, he's actually on this sheet right here. Uh, the initial head shape was uh, sort of triangular, like so. like that. And it just yeah, it just depends on the face and how much exaggeration you're doing. All right, let's get back to that here. I'm going to shrink this down a little bit so you can see. I think it was being cut off by my head a little bit. There we go. <clears throat> Looks like Marshall again. Okay. <laughs> oh, the Bill Nye. Gotcha. All right. Let's, so let's find. So I, I didn't. These aren't really what I would call technically rhythms. They're just alignment lines, and they help me place my rhythms. So I'm going to find the brow rhythm first here. I'm going to draw this arcing line from one side of the face to the other around that center line. And then the bottoms of the bags of the eyes. Gustavo asks, when you draw these initial lines, there's a proportion that you follow or just see the original photo. Yeah, I'm not following the proportions of any template or formula. Um, you do when you draw the Riley rhythms, the Riley rhythms um, for a portrait, because we want to get everyone's head roughly in the same space and the same proportion. Uh, but for caricature, no, the proportions are completely different. They're based on the rough sketch that you're currently drawing. Okay. And let's find the curvature of the brows down uh, as they come together here. You can also represent the curvature of the brows here with a circle rhythm on the front of the forehead. That's not on the diagram, but it, it is something I do sometimes based on my experience with the Riley abstraction. I think that is on Riley's original abstraction is this circle rhythm on the forehead. It helps find the curvature of the, of the medial portion of the eyebrows. All right, let's find the, um, the crease of the upper lids now. And I want to maintain the same height and width on either side of the center line. Then the actual eye opening themselves, which is pretty close to the eyelids, 
working with really narrow parameters here. And his eyes are pretty symmetrical. There's not, you know, they're not really asymmetrical or anything. So um, on the Chris Farley one, they were a bit more skewed and a little funkier because of the angle. Here they're more natural or more uh, in line with each other. All right, so we've got the front plane of the nose here. And this is the tricky part here. I'm not, um, you know, I'm not always confident that the nose is going to turn out, especially because it's the one feature that doesn't have, you know, it's opposite on the other side of the, the center line. In an extreme angle like this too, uh, all you can do is just connect these things up to the guidelines as best you can and think about them in terms of just an abstraction in and by itself without, you know, without the thing underneath. I'm using the sketch underneath, of course, as my guide, but just very, very loosely refer to it and don't be a slave to it. Oops. So that's a little bit um, asymmetrical there. Let's bring in the nose on this side and bring it out a little further on the right side. Nope, a little too close. I'm trying to find the front plane of the nose here and I want to make sure it matches from one side to the other. Yeah, but the thing about the nose, man, it's, uh, it sits off the front plane of the face quite a bit. So I think that's why, I, yeah, that is my tendency. I think I, I am following it correctly. Um, I'm sometimes scared to veer off that center line, but I have to remember that that nose, you know, you're looking at the face from the side here, and this is the center line we drew right down the face. You're going to have the brow kind of coming out in front of that, and the nose comes in front of that, and the mouth, the dental arch sits in front of that. So... Keeping that in mind is really, this is a really difficult stuff here, I must say. It takes a while to get sensitive to that, um, finding the, how the front plane of the nose sits off the front plane of the face. So yeah, I think my initial instincts here were correct to actually have them deviate quite a bit from the center line. So this is the part, because of this angle, um, the nose isn't going to be quite following that center line. and draw the um, ridge of the nostrils or the wings of the nose from side to side. And also keep in mind from this angle, there's an ex there's the, the tooth cylinder, the dental arch here is an extreme cylinder. It's, if I were to draw the contours, it would be sort of like that, maybe even more so. So the bottom, the outside planes of the nostrils are going to be much lower than where the septum of the nose meets that cylinder, sort of like so. And that's really going to be what helps sell the three-dimensional quality of this face. And then I'm going to draw a rhythm down where the side plane of the nose meets the front plane of the cheek. And just a little bit on the far side, you can see it a little bit. Uh, Dimrault says, the front plane not getting cut in half symmetrically was kind of confusing me. Now I get it. Okay, cool. Uh, very helpful class, Mr. Jones. Please call me Court. Um, not only for caricature art, but for improving general drawing. Yes, um, you can abstract anything in this world. You, the Riley abstraction we talk about usually just refers to the head and figure. But you can look at a tree or a house or a mountain and draw an abstract version of it. Uh, looking for the important landmarks and then drawing a simplified abstract version of it before moving on uh, to do a final contour drawing. And that's perfectly acceptable. I mean, that's great if you could do that, especially things, natural forms like trees that can have totally different shapes based on which species it is. It can really help just if you can find the major shapes and the major rhythms. Don't draw every single leaf or branch first. Draw the, the masses and how they connect with one another first. And... Um, yeah, you can use the abstraction for anything, basically. It was really helpful for, I think, concept designing, creature design. Yeah. 
All right, let us find the curvature of the mouth now. And, oh, you know, let's find the, um, the ears and the ear to chin rhythms. I think that's really important. So our brow wraps around the spheroid shape of the head here. And wraps around on this side as well. And the nose, bottom of the plane of the nose, I want to make sure these two lines are parallel. The, uh, the wraparound line from the brow and the wraparound line from the uh, bottom of the nose. And if you have trouble placing it, make sure you, you, know, you can draw a, a guideline like so that's parallel with the other guidelines. And that's where the ear will meet that sideways um, guideline here. Okay, so the ear um, on this side should be about right here. And it, the top of the ear should meet um, that guideline wrapping around the side there. Uh, but it's, it's the top of the ear is obscured by the hair, and that's going to be the true on the other side as well. Here the ear actually doesn't sit on the outside of the head, but it cuts in a little bit, so... Right about so. And there's the ears. Okay, now we can find the ear to chin rhythm. And this is a much different angle because of the angle that the head is at. So it's going to be the top of the ear, the ridge of the zygomatic arch, the zygomatic bone, and sharply down to the corners of the mouth and the edge of the chin. Now that I've got the one on the right side here that I like, I can now make the ear to chin rhythm on the left side match to the other ear. There we go. And that's going to help me find out where that cheekbone is in relationship to everything else. Uh, there is another rhythm which isn't shown in my diagram, but I think I do go over it a bit in my Proco videos, and that's it's basically a top of the ear to the bottom of the nose rhythm, and that helps find the underside of the cheekbone. like so. All right, then um, here is our uh, front bottom plane of the chin, and then where the mentalis muscle is, it's the circular rhythm of the front of the chin. It's The surface feature is called the chin boss, if that makes sense. Um, it's just a term that anatomists use, I guess. Um, and then there's the lower lip, which sort of actually follows the um, curvature of the mouth as well. And that's, um, you know, I don't always do a lip rhythm. Sometimes I do. Depends on the face. And then the, oh, we have to do the uh, nasal labial rhythm. And that goes from the tops of the wings of the nose down to the outs just to the outside corner of the mouth. And it comes back up by the chin here. Actually, technically it comes up above the chin boss. And again, I have this you know, teardrop shape or pear shape on the right side of the face. Now I can draw it on the left side and make it match. And that follows the contours of the, the crease of the nasal labial fold down to where if, you know, if he's making this downward expression here with the, you get a sort of a uh, ridge and a crease because of the action of the uh, labial platysma pulling the corners of the mouth downward and outward while the chin boss or the mentalis is being pushed up. I'm doing one of these. And he makes that expression a lot, or it's a very Trumpian uh, expression, I think. And he's not making it super strong here, but I might want to push it a little bit because I know it's an expression he does. Um, now that I'm actually seeing the head in proportion too uh, with this Riley abstraction, what I think might be fun is to actually lengthen the neck a little bit to expose more of the neck. And here's where I'm actually changing the exaggeration. Um, something I always do, but I think it's, I think I can get away with it here. There we go. Just feel like it needed more neck because we're looking up at him. We, you know, we have, we see, so, we see so much of the bottom of the neck and the chin, bottom of the chin. 
Yeah, that feels a little better. Um, and he's got this great fold of like neck fat hanging over the collar. And there's no real rhythm for that. I'm just going to draw it in a simplified abstract way. So the new collar is down here, a little bit lower. Okay. And uh, because his hair is such a unique thing, we've got to definitely draw his hair in here. That's a super important part of his likeness. Um, and again, no, no, there's no standard rhythm for hair, especially this kind of hairstyle, which nobody else has. Uh, but I'm just going to draw a simplified version of what I've got in my rough sketch. Um, but I have to take into account the new head shape, where I, um, I, uh, I added a little bit of mass to the left side of the head over here, so the hairline's going to, the hair's going to move just a little bit further to the left. And draw a rhythm for the sort of that wave like shape where he combs it over and then there's the part over here which has sort of a unique shape all of its own as well okay oh you know I didn't indicate yet the separation between the eyes that's pretty important so I'm gonna get the inside corner of the eye here and measure the distance between the corner of the nose, or sorry, where the side plane of the nose ends. And the head's turned a little bit, so it's gonna be pretty close to the bridge of the nose in this, on this angle. And then we've got the underside of the eyebrows here. He's making sort of a, you know, a stern or angry expression. Um, and this is just to give me a guide when I'm doing the final drawing. It's not, you know, I mean, not every single thing needs to be highlighted or redrawn, just so you have enough to figure out where to go in the final drawing. Well, let's see. Dimrold says his ears are quite small compared to the size of his head on the reference photo. Yeah. Um, but like I said, it's um, covered up by the hair here, so if I were to actually draw them accurately, we'd only see about this much of the ear. And I don't usually like to erase abstraction lines in a drawing, but I'll erase it just so it's a little clear, a little more clear to view. But yeah, that's about all, about all of the ear we'd see is this portion right here. And the same thing over here, I think it's uh, the top of the ear. The hair just covers the top part, part of the ear, he brushes it over the tops of his ears. So they look smaller than what they are. Um, and oh, you know, I didn't really figure out yet the bottom, you know, the jowls and how the face blends into the neck. And that's just a unique rhythm that's based just on his personal physique. Um, but I can try to find ways to connect it from one side to the other. So here, sort of the jowl on the left side meets up with the jowl on the right. But it is, it's distorted and funky because there's like this compression of fat on the right side of the face, or right side of the neck. And he's got um, this crease down the center of his neck, the skin folds hang down. And then just where the forms bend from um, a front-facing plane to a downward-facing plane on his uh, on his jawline, something like that. There we go. And if I want to get really you know specific, I can also figure out his the width of his nostrils, the wings of the nose, and the nostril openings are like so. And yeah, and then the, maybe his collar. All right, so let's take a look what we got here. Yeah, so hopefully this is going to be a better, a more well-constructed drawing than the uh, than the rough sketch. I like the rough sketch's likeness, but it is a little strange in places. Now here, if I um, I haven't actually done this yet, let me flip this uh, horizontally. Yeah, 
you might be able to see some of the things that are a little off or just don't look right. Like here you can see this eye, yeah, is too low. It needs to be moved up and maybe inward a little bit. Um, but yeah, the, the Riley abstraction to me is a way of, it's, it's what you do to correct all these things that is a step beyond just flipping it in reverse. Flipping it in reverse is sort of the first stage to help you realize, oh wait, this is funky, this is messed up. Let's, let's actually do a recorrection of this drawing. And the abstraction is there to be that mechanical process you go through to make uh, those corrections and have, be confident that it'll help make your face look more three-dimensionally solid and in perspective. So hopefully that makes sense. That's, um, yeah, that's basically all I got for today. Let me see what the last questions are here. Uh, let's see. JG asks, how do you live drawing caricatures? Are you drawing illustrations, covers? something else. I really like Jason Seiler's style too, as do I. Uh, and uh, I just started your caricature course. Really awesome. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I do live caricatures a lot at parties and events, except for right now I'm not working because there are no parties and events happening in the world. Uh, but I don't do this kind of drawing when I'm doing events. I just do markers or I, you know, I draw digitally, uh, but I do those drawings in like three to five minutes and they're just more like entertainment or performance art and they're not always correct and they're not always the best likeness. <laughs> um, but yeah, I do that and I do some illustration work, uh, private commissions here in the studio. I haven't done as much illustration as someone like Jason Seiler who seems to always be working. Um, but yeah, I just haven't really gotten into that world as much as I would have liked, I guess. Um, I think he had an agent for years and he got his foot in the door and got a lot of good um, commissions because of that and also because he's just amazing and awesome and can produce work quickly that's of a high quality uh, let's see hello shiny says this is cool to see you do this and yes it it's not really explains anywhere too well it's not explained too well anywhere it's true um, it's it's a shame it's a really solid process that's helped me out this you know the, the, the application of what Riley taught and uh, putting it into caricature uh, but yeah it's not taught a lot um, it's, it was a very small lineage of uh, artists that followed him and then went through the 20th into the 21st century carrying those traditions on but if you went to the right school you you can get that kind of instruction uh, hello shiny says um, so check the constructions for, yeah Antonio says Trump's face is a caricature even if painted realistic agreed <laughs> uh, Anthony says thanks Dimworld says, thanks again. Comics Legend says, do the lines always have to touch? Why don't the cheekbone lines line up with the corner of the eye on this drawing? Um, it's because, yeah, the, the, his face is just very different. It's, it's different for everybody. And, you know, maybe I could have made the cheekbone lines a little higher, you know, looking at it now, perhaps. Um, so, yeah, that's, that may be something I could, I could work on uh, or I'll think about when I do a tracing of this. Uh, but, yeah, it's not, it's going to change for everybody um, on some people. You know, one, one rhythm I didn't do is actually the muzzle rhythm on this one now that I'm looking at it. And that is a fairly important rhythm. Um, I mean, the fact that I didn't do it is not really a big deal because I could kind of figure it out just by looking at it. But um, just to be thorough, the muzzle rhythm would be something like so. I'm getting this weird thing sometimes where when I draw a few strokes, part of the drawing will turn like the lines will turn red, blue, and yellow, and green. I don't know what's going on there. I don't know if you saw that. Um, oops, the muzzle rhythm actually goes just below the bags of the eyes. So anyway, uh, yeah, just a, a rhythm I just fixed there, uh, or added it in a little bit hastily. But oh, yeah, there it goes. I'm not sure what's going on there. That happened in another program I was working in. Do you guys see that? Um, if I hit undo, it'll like undo it. Or if I do another stroke, yeah, that uh, might be a, my Wacom screen. I don't know if you can see that or not, but if anyone has any ideas what that is, let me know. Uh, okay, so just signing off here, I guess. I have um, any last questions? Uh, this will help make sense of it. Cool, thank you, Keith. Uh, Roger says, appreciate this. Thanks. Yeah, definitely. Thank you guys for joining me, and um, uh, be sure to follow me. You know, Subscribe on YouTube here, and uh, check out you know, future videos, future live streams. I hope to do one within the next few days or the beginning of next week. Um, and also on Instagram at Court Jones Artist and Facebook at Court Jones Studio. Um, might be a bleaching effect. Yeah. If any of you guys have thoughts on what's happening with that color weird thing happening, 
or how to solve that, let me know. It just started happening yesterday. Uh, let's see. Husky asks, how often do I make caricature? Oh, it depends. Um, sometimes I go a couple weeks without doing anything, or sometimes I do it several days in a row. It just depends on what else is going on in the world. I'm not very regular in my habits. Uh, thanks, guys. Um, hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.